time, so she's going to come by next Sunday and uh, give a report in the 11 o'clock service. Um, that's kind of a, I don't want to say sprung on us, but uh, short notice, but we told her we were, we're real flexible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Say yes. All right. So she'll be here next week. 13th will be our quarterly business meeting. Two things we're going to do. We're going to look at, at our quarterly report. And then we're also going to talk about uh, the possibility of, of selling the bus. There, uh, I talked it over with the deacons, and uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we'll discuss that uh, during the meeting. Uh, that's one of the things that we're going to look at. Also, we have a deacon meeting on that day, so it's going to be pretty busy. Uh, missionary Prince Stephanie Granger will be here on the 20th in the 11 o'clock service, work day the 26th. Uh, we will have that. Even if the weather's uh, not real good, because we got uh, kind of a major project to work on that day, and then the 27th be family day. All right, just uh, last week I brought yes, Mary. Yeah, Harper. Harper. Ah, yeah, I don't, I don't have that either. Uh, I can <laughs> tell you about that though. On har on the harvest party, <coughs> we're going to do the harvest party and the trunk or treat together. And that will be immediately after the service on Family Day. Okay, so we'll have the we'll have the meal, and then the, the trunk or treat. Yeah, our, the harvest party is the Family Day. Right, in, in, in lieu of yeah. the Family Day dinner. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't that, forgot all about that. So um, I'll I'll make. That for, uh, I'll, no. I'll do it just for the team. Okay. That, and uh, I think most of you know already, but not, Edith Williams passed away. And so the funeral is Wednesday at 1 o'clock, and that will be at Eller South Chapel over here on uh, Webster Street. And then we'll have a uh, carrying dinner after that. Not carrying, but with dinner. Okay. And that's what the clipboard is. been one of those weeks, I'm telling you. Um, the matching gift that I mentioned last week, that was met. So we have the money for the parking lot, and that is already scheduled for uh, fall break, which we figure is the best time to do that because they have to have the parking lot closed off. So they're going to be do, working on it uh, during fall break. So mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. All right, I think that'll do. Dan's gonna come lead us in a song. <coughs> Turn in your hymnal to 153, 153.
morning. All right. Uh, we're going to finish our topic here this morning on hope, and then, Lord willing, not next week, but the week after, we will be back to our, uh, our series in Mark. So, really kind of the flagship uh, verse for hope, or at least one that I go to often, is John 16.33. Um, so, if you want to go ahead and start turning there, that's kind of where we'll start uh, this, uh, this morning. So we talked a little bit last week about what it, we had to define what true biblical hope is. Because we discussed the fact that everybody wants hope. Everybody um, tends to say that they, they, they want, you've just got to give people hope. But we do have to define what those things mean because what happens is if you just allow people to sit back and define these things, then oftentimes they'll have a jaded view on what that term actually means. It works um, also with love. We have, uh, if, we, if we tell people that, well, all right, so here at the church we are supposed to love people, but we can't really just say that based on the, um, the totally different viewpoints that people have of what love is. So when we say that we need to give people hope or that we need to love people, we don't go based on our own interpretation of what we mean those things to be. We have to look to God's word and we have to look at, the, at what he says that, he, that it is. Amen. All right? So if we look around, it's very easy to do that you would look around. It's very easy to feel hopeless. It's very easy to feel hopeless, um, and it seems uh, because all of these things that go on, all of what we would describe as the bad things that happen in this world. In fact, the entire world which we live is surrounded by chaos, or at least it appears to be. Um, this, uh, this study was taken uh, uh, back in 2022. It said over the past five years, the U.S. has experienced an average of $18 billion natural disasters per year. Between 2012 and 2022, tropical cyclones were the costliest natural disasters among, uh, among billion-dollar weather disasters. And between the years of 2012 and 22, measuring the damage cost of $744.3 billion. Followed by severe storms, $218 billion, and droughts, $112.9 billion. Between January 2013 and January 2023, 88.5% of all U.S. All U.S. counties de declared a natural disaster, including 95% of the 200 most populated counties. Between 2018 and 2022, the uh, U.S. saw an average of 59,097 wildfires per year that burned an average of 7.6 million acres. Chaos. And it's easy to look at those things and feel hopeless. Now, many of us, we have experienced obviously natural disasters, we, but we look at numbers like that and we think about just, wow, that's just almost too much to comprehend. In fact, I, I, we did not, we, even our day-to-day -day little inconveniences, uh, oftentimes if we get ourselves in this place of the flesh, then we're thinking, oh God, why me? And it seems as though the one thing that's consistent in this world is inconsistency. Yep. It's easy to get intimidated by the world. It's easy to want to stick our heads in the sand, but that's not what we're told to do. 
In fact, there are many different avenues in which humanists are trying to offer some sort of fix for all the issues of mankind. Well, if we just, if we just make it an even playing field, if we just make sure that everybody has enough and that everybody is successful, but you can't do that. And in our anchor verse, though, we have to look because we can try to look to a person. We can try to look to a political party. We can try to look to anything else to try to find hope. But at the end of the day, it all comes up short. They all leave you disappointed. In fact, even in the church, there are often times that people get excited and they're doing, and, and a lot of good things are coming out of it, but they're not looking to Christ. They're looking to a pastor or a leader, and that is the person that is going to lead us and is going to motivate us and is going to allow us to do these things. But then, oh no, we find out that they're also human and they also fall. So our hope doesn't need to be in a person. Our hope does not be, need to be in the, uh, in the flesh because ultimately you will get let down. And that's why in John 16, 33, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And many times I come back to this because if we put into context what is going to happen... Jesus knows that they are about to experience the, what would seem to be the worst thing in their lives. And he tells them these words. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. We're on board with that. We could camp out with that. Well, yeah, I want peace. I want to be peaceful. I want everything to, to work out. And everything does work out, but not in the sense of what we like to see. And if he would just stop there, that would leave it to interpretation. Well, yeah, you see, Jesus just wants us to be peaceful people. He just wants us to have peace. He wants us, and then again, if we were to describe it on our own, well, what gives me peace? Well, peace gives me enough, enough money in the bank gives me peace. Enough, uh, enough material things give me peace. But you, you fine folks in, this, in here this morning know that that's not what he's talking about. Because he doesn't stop there. He goes on to clarify what he means. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. Almost seems like if you just stay there, wait. That is kind of a contradiction, isn't it? He just says, and, and by the way, Jesus is the one that says that he is authority over everything. He's the creator of the world. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. So if somebody wants you to have peace, you would think that he would be the one that could manufacture it for us. But then he goes on to say, but in the world you're going to have tribulation. Well, how can you have peace and how can you have tribulation? He doesn't leave us confused. He says... But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus spoke these words just before the cross. Jesus spoke these words because he knew that they, are, they were going to be fearful. He knew that they were going to experience tribulation like they had never experienced tribulation before. And Jesus knew that these words would echo throughout history for all, uh, for all believers of all time because the fact of the matter is no matter how long this world goes on, one thing that we can expect, especially as believers, is tribulation.
He knew that all the chaos that they were going to encounter, he knew all the hopelessness that they were in danger of feeling. But he starts with his will for them. His will for them is that in me you may have peace. And the will that he had for them on that day and moving forward is the same will that he has for us today. That in him you may have peace. You may not have peace in your job. You may not have peace in relationships. You may not have peace in this world. But we know that our hope is not in the world. And I know that we typically are really, really hard on humanists and that whole, uh, that whole belief system. But, but and the reality is they are doing the very best that they can without God. They're trying to come up with a fix. And they're sincere in it because they truly believe in their heart of hearts that they can fix it. That if we just do enough, if we just have a good enough society, if we have just a perfect set of circumstances, then people are inevitably going to do the right thing. But if we look at the record, and if we look at history, we will realize that mankind, even in the best circumstances ever given, still fall flat on their face. In fact, all the natural disasters that we talked about just a moment ago, and we could spend our entire time and many times over talking about all of these natural disasters and these bad things that happen, but every single thing is a reminder to us that we cannot fix it. So His will for us is that in Him, You've got to keep that. that. He says, in me you may have peace. That is God's will for my life. That is God's will for your life. But it's not a peace that's based on circumstance. But rather it's a peace based on the knowledge of who is in control. There are some folks out there, even some that are believers, that if November doesn't work out the way that they want it to, they think, oh, it's over. It's not over. Amen. It's not over. Because no matter what happens in this world, God is still in control. He's still in control. You say, well, sometimes things, things happen that don't make sense to me. Well, the good thing is he doesn't have to take your counsel. He's in control. That's why Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, By the way, if you are experiencing hopelessness, if you are experiencing uh, depression, if you are experiencing being overwhelmed by the, uh, by the world, just camp out in Philippians for a while. Because by the way, it's the epistle of joy. But then when you start out, you would think, what is joyful about this? Because you'll realize that Paul is, Paul is writing this letter from the equivalent of prison. Paul is uncertain about his future. He doesn't know if he could be executed at any time. And yet he pins what we would call the epistle of joy. Why is that? Well, we, say, we see in Philippians 4, 6-7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything. that would make a lot of us anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Let your request be made known to God. 
We don't demand anything from God. We go to Him, and He cares about us. He cares about what we care about. He cares about the suffering of people. That's why he hates sin so much, is because sin hurts people. He cares about what's going on in our lives. But oftentimes, because what we would say is an answered prayer is the fact that I was in the circumstance, I prayed about it, and the circumstance changed. Sometimes that happens. But it's a pretty high percentage that I'm in this circumstance, I I, I pray, and the circumstance is the same. And many would describe that as, well, that's an unanswered prayer. But in fact, we, we see that Paul had a circumstance, which is, uh, the, which is known as a thorn in the flesh. He had a circumstance, and he prayed, and he asked God to take it away. Not for, not for selfish reasons, but he's, he's really wanting, he's going to give God the glory. He's going to do these things for the glory of God. It's going to be able to, uh, to overcome some of the, uh, some of the uh, pitfalls that he's, that he's experiencing. And we would say, well, did God not answer his prayer because he didn't change the circumstance? And we oftentimes we measure whether an answered prayer is the change in the circumstance. But oftentimes it's not about the change of the circumstance, but it's about him coming alongside of you and changing us and who we are in that circumstance. Because he goes on in verse 7, he says, and the peace of God. There again, we have to think about what is the peace of God? Well, it goes on to describe it in these verses. It says, which surpasses all understanding. All understanding. It and we oftentimes use that passage to think about us being having peace and people being able to see peace in our lives when chaos surrounds us, but it sur- not only surpasses their understanding, it surpasses our own understanding. God, I don't know why I should have peace in this. Everything is caving in and the walls are closing in on me, but I'm going to trust in you. A peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a petitioning, a pleading with God And with thanksgiving, we make our request known. And he promises to give us the peace of God. See, many churches are making promises on God's behalf. Many Christians make promises on God's behalf. But the problem is, sometimes they make promises that God never made. God is faithful to fulfill His promises. But if we go based on the promises that people are making for God, God does not have to be faithful in fulfilling those promises. He promises that He will give you peace. He doesn't promise that He'll take away the circumstance. He doesn't promise that everything that you do will always prosper and everything is always going to, to, uh, to work out and that you'll never have to lose a, 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 a night's sleep or that you'll never have to uh, go through uh, turmoil and trials. He promises the opposite. We just choose not to listen to that part. The peace of God. The peace of God that can keep you steady when the sea of life is full of waves and uncertainty. And this is the type of peace that Jesus was speaking about 
in John 16, 33. Because you got to think about the things that the disciples had to face. The apostles, you had to think about the things that the early church had to face. It was tasked to them that you are going to go and you are going to tell the things that you've seen, the things that you've heard. You're going to tell others uh, about me and about your experiences and all of these other things. But you've got to realize that everything in their flesh would not want to go. They just witnessed what happened the last time that they were out and about, and they were just regional. How are these other places going to respond? You see, they had to have peace that surpassed understanding because if it was a peace that they could understand, they would not have done it. He promises peace. He promises tribulation. In fact, if we're real honest with ourselves, we, will, we can say that no one's exempt from tribulation. Even the, even the prosperity of all prosperity preachers are not exempt from some sort of tribulation. You may not hear about it, because after all, that's the, that's the house of cards, and that's the foundation that it's built upon, is that if you have favor with God, then He's going to give you everything that you desire. In fact, some go as far as to say that if you have the favor of God, you'll always get the best parking spot. I'm very low on that totem pole. I get a bad parking spot almost every time. But here's the thing. This is what we do is whenever we say silly things like that, and many people will say, well, what's the harm in, in making people feel good and making people think that, that, that God is, is favoring them and putting them in favorable circumstance? It's because there's going to be life that hits. And when, when people that are saying that they are preaching the Word of God, when they have made promises that God did not make, then people are going to hold God accountable for those promises. Say, what's the harm? There's a lot of harm. Because God wants so much more for His people than the best parking spot. No one is exempt from tribulation. And in fact, when we talk about the fact that, oh God, if God favors you, then all of these little menial things will work out. But when life happens, when the uncertainty kicks in, when we can't see what the other side of this looks like, I want the God that concerns Himself more than whether I have a good parking spot or not. The world is in chaos. In fact, it seems that there are many that prosper that wouldn't have the favor of God. And see, when you look and if you put your hope, if you put your faith, if you put your trust in the fact of, well, if you have favor of God, then you're just doing well with all of these temporal things, then it doesn't, it doesn't translate because there are people that are not God-honoring. There are people that are, not, uh, that are not believers, that don't believe in really anything but themselves, and they seem to be doing better than I am.
But we see in Matthew 5.45, it says, So that you may, you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So here in our community, whether you're evil or whether you're righteous, you are experiencing the same weather that we're all experiencing. And many prosperity gospels will, t will, will teach it like this in the fact that, that if it's raining, the favor of God is the fact that you, you, it's, it's kind of like an, uh, an umbrella. So you're just, you can just walk through life and you don't have to deal with the garbage that everybody else has to deal with. And you'll talk to people that are that subscribe to the, to to that heresy, and they'll they will trick themselves into believing that that yeah, I'm favored by God, so I don't deal with these things. But they're not favored; they're delusional. Because what really happens is when all of this mess is going on over here, they just kind of they just kind of look away. The unsaved can be happy, successful people. They can be happy, happy, successful people in the world, and saved people can have hard times. We are all subject to certain things, both good and bad. But it's not about happiness. This is where we get confused when we think about joy and we think about hope and we think about all of these things. It's not about happiness or your feelings or how you feel. Because it's not based on my feeling. Because if I serve my feelings, then it's going to put me in a very bad spot. If I serve my feelings, I'm going to do what I want to do. If I serve my feelings, I might not be here this morning. I don't, I don't feel like going. If I serve my feelings, I'll go here, I'll go there, I'll do what I want because I felt this. But now, I don't feel that anymore, so I want to feel... It doesn't work that way. So when we talk about joy, when we talk about peace, when we talk about hope, we're not talking about feelings. And you see, the church in America, we have made everything that has to do with God about the way that we feel. Why? Because... We have the luxury of not having to deal with that much in, in, in the realm of persecution and all these other things. We have the convenience of the fact that we can, we can preach these things such as prosperity and happiness and, and love is really just doing what you want to do and we never talk about anything that's uncomfortable because really we're comfortable for the most part from the world's standards. But I assure you that there are places all over the world that they understand that the peace of God is not a feeling. So when people say, well, what is the harm with the message of hope that some of these places preach? It's harmful because it's not the hope that the Bible talks about. That's the harm. The peace, the hope that the Bible talks about is that no matter the circumstance, no matter what goes on, even if your life is, is filled with one tragic event after another, our hope is not here. Our hope is not that I'll have a good day today. Our hope is in the fact that one of these days he's going to fulfill his promises as he's done in the past and that eventually he is going to come back and he's going to make it right. 
Our hope is in the fact that one of these days, though all of those loved ones that we've had to say goodbye to, that we, our hope is in the fact that one of these days we're going to be reunited with them. And we're going to be together again. In fact, when you, whenever you're, you're, you're at a funeral, as we're going to experience one this week, there's going to be, there's always sadness. There's always sadness because there is, there, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get to, we don't get to see that individual. We don't get to talk to them. We don't get to see them. There are a lot of folks that were staples in, in bringing this congregation together and did a lot of things for a, for a lot of people for a lot of years. And then they passed away and we haven't been able to experience those conversations. But our hope is in the fact that one of these days we will be with them again. That's the only true hope. And his promise is that he has, he says in his word, I have overcome the world. Notice he did not say that I will. One of these days, I will overcome the world. No, it's already happened. He's already won. If you ever, if you ever, wa- there's not, not a lot of people watch live TV anymore. But one thing that we still watch live TV on is usually sports. And now you have options that you don't even have to do that. You can record it, right? I'm going to tell you, whenever I record something, if I, it's, it's super hard to record something and not know the outcome. It's everywhere. You almost just have to just completely go into darkness and not talk to anybody, not look at anything, because it's everywhere. We have instant information. And most of the time, if we were to record a sporting event or whatever the case may be, we want to experience it as though we are watching it live, even though it's already been done. And most of the time, somebody has spoiled it for you. Or you accidentally pulled up something and you saw the final score. Okay? Now, if the end was favorable to you, you get less mad throughout the game. You say, oh, that was that was a that was a terrible call. That was, that was a that was a foul. But I know we're going to win. Go ahead. I know we're going to win. That's obviously not a perfect example, but that is in the fact that no matter how many. Bad things, no matter how bleak it looks, God has already won. He's already overcome it. Just like when he told Joshua that every single piece of ground that you tread upon, it's already yours. There were some times that it didn't seem like it was. They still had to go through obstacles. They still had to go through opposition. But they knew that the promise was true because the one that was faithful to deliver on that promise. And that is his promise today. His promise is not that the weather's going to be favorable today. You're going to get a good parking spot if you go out to the restaurant after church uh, this afternoon. his, His promises are so much more than that. His promises are, you may have a bad parking spot the rest of your life. His promises are, you may not have good days. Because if God is just, if the favor of God is measured on us having and feeling good. How do you tell a family that is losing someone that you're losing them because you don't have the favor of God? 
Or how do you go into a tragic event and you try to speak of this shallow prosperity Christianity that says that the only reason that bad things happen to you is because you don't have a favor of God. Who would want to serve a God like that? There is no power in that. The power is in the fact that Yes, you're going through that. Yes, you are going through a tragic event. And though you can't see it, now He has overcome it. We experience victories and we experience losses. We experience good days. We experience bad days. Jesus is not promising that we will, at, we will always have victory over this world, but He has promised that He has overcome it. Because of the immediate audience, Jesus is speaking to the apostles, telling them, times are going to get bleak. Things are going to get scary. And still, I have overcame all of those things. And here we are, all these years later, and still His message is the same. Things are going to get bleak. Things are going to get scary. There's going to be times that you don't want to, don't feel like it, don't feel His presence, but He's saying your feeling of My presence does not negate the fact that He's present. Times are going to get bleak. Things are going to get hard. But we can be of good cheer. Why? Because He's overcame the world. He's overcome it. He's already won. He's all, he already has the victory. And I don't know when the time is going to come when enough is enough and He comes for us and He wraps this whole thing up. Hopefully it's today. I'd be all right with that. But even if it's not, the surety is that it's going to happen. So whatever you're going through, and this is the message of hope that the church should have. We shouldn't have a message of hope that's saying, well, God just wants you to prosper all the time. No, God, we don't prosper all the time. We don't always have good days all of the time. Our hope is not in the things that will pass away. Our hope is in the eternal. Our hope is in the fact that one of these days, He's going to make everything right. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the hope that we have in you. Father, I'm grateful that I don't have to put my hope in myself. I'm grateful that nobody has to put their hope in me, Father, because that's a, that's a scary place to be, Father. We can put our hope in you. We can put our security in you, Father. We can give you everything and just trust that you will make everything all right. Father, we sure, it's, I know that it's easy to say, but Father, help us. We need Holy Spirit power to be able to yield to you and let go and let you move in whatever way that you see fit. And we pray, God, that you would do that in our lives. Pray for our pastor in the next service, Father. Pray, God, that as he shares with us what you have put on his heart, pray, God, that you would help us to receive it. But, Father, not just to receive it, but to apply it, Father. You gave us your word, yes, to hear, yes, to learn, but as application to our lives. And we pray, God, that it wouldn't just stay here for us to pick up next week, but, Father, that we would take it with us that we would study it, that we would meditate upon it, and that, Father, we would allow it to influence our everyday lives.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Break time.